Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the campus uh, COVID-19 briefing. Uh, please note that as usual, we'll have live captioning and ASL translations available, and that a recording will be posted later today up on my website. What we've started doing when we were post the uh, recordings is we include timestamps that go to each specific topic or question that was addressed to make it easier to find the information that you're most interested in. Uh, today, we'll be going till around 10 a.m. and we'll get to as many questions as we can. And you could ask questions, of course, using the Q&A function. Uh, today, we're joined by Provost Susan Collins, Vice President for Student Life, Martino Harmon, Chief Health Officer and Physician, Preeti Milani, Rob Ernst, a physician who leads our Campus Health Response Committee and is Associate Vice President of Student Life for Health and Wellness and Executive Director of the University Health Service, uh, Emily Martin, an Associate Professor of Epidemiology in our School of Public Health and a member of our Campus Health Response Committee, uh, as well as ASL translators, Marciano Gongora and Stevie Westfall. So thank you to the translators as well. Uh, this week, we're gonna focus significantly on current conditions on our campus and discuss them in the context of public health, share how some of our foremost experts are thinking about campus life now and going forward. I also know there are many questions about some of the processes and policies and safety measures we have in place and we'll address those too, uh, while saving time at the end, if possible, for additional questions from members of our community. Uh, as the SARS-CoV-2 virus has changed, we've changed as well at the University of Michigan. Uh, thankfully, we have much more information than we did a year or even a semester or even a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the members of our Campus Health Response uh, Committee are experts in their domains, and we put a list of them and their positions up uh, on the screen. Uh, they meet multiple times a week and keep closely abreast of federal, state, and local public health guidelines that inform uh, where we are and what we're doing here on campus. They also closely follow what other institutions are doing through their professional associations and contacts, and they're well-versed in emerging research around the pandemic. Uh, this is no small task as we know how quickly guidelines and knowledge are, are changing. Uh, the science and everything we've learned over the past year and a half are reshaping our vision of what lies ahead. We know COVID-19 will be with us into the indefinite future, but we have better tools to reduce risk and harm. We know that the vaccines offer strong protection from severe illness and death, and these vaccines can be improved upon uh, as time goes by. Michigan Medicine is now scheduling third dose appointments for patients with compromised immunity who've already received both doses of an mRNA vaccine at least 28 days ago. Uh, we'll continue to track emerging data and guidance from the FDA and CDC and be prepared to provide booster shots of the vaccine uh, when they're recommended. Uh, vaccination and natural infection synergize with one another, increasing an individual's level of protection. Therefore, we'll still see a brighter future but it's one in which we're gonna to have to learn to live with COVID-19, just like we've learned to live with seasonal influenza and other respiratory viruses. Our vaccination levels are increasing, over 93% of students, 92% of faculty, and more than 78% of staff have reported and we validated their vaccination status. Uh, we're very proud of the response to the vaccine requirement. This remains the single most important thing we can do as a community to limit spread and severity of disease. Uh, emerging data backs this up. A, a Los Angeles County analysis uh, published recently showed that the rate of infection among vaccinated individuals over a one week period was one in 1,567. For the unvaccinated, it was one in 317. Uh, this data came from surveillance data um, acquired between May 1st and July 25th uh, as the Delta virus was surging. Hospitalization rates offer an even more convincing argument for vaccination. One in 100,000 were hospitalized amongst vaccinated persons, and the rate in unvaccinated persons was 29.4 per 100,000. This means that the rate of infection is five times lower for those who are vaccinated, and the hospitalization rate is almost 30 times lower. Uh, these data offer tremendous reassurance in a highly vaccinated community such as ours. Uh, we're gonna post a link to this uh, data and article uh, online. 
Uh, we appreciate the strong compliance with indoor masking, uh, another important component of our safety, layered safety plans. Uh, I encourage folks to wear a mask in crowded outdoor areas as well. Uh, use your best judgment what crowded means, what it means for you personally. Masks are an important part uh, of layered safety, and there's new data coming out on masking uh, and the effect of masking on transmission, even in classrooms. Um, we know there'll be uh, continue to be cases of COVID-19 in the campus community. Uh, however, this layered approach has made our campus environment safe for us to return and capture the many advantages of residential higher education community that our students need uh, and they deserve. I'd add that this scenario doesn't apply just to highly vaccinated college campus, but more broadly to a society with easy access to vaccination now. Where communities run into trouble is when the rate of vaccination is low and thus infection is severe and can overwhelm healthcare capacity. I'd like to begin our discussions today with Dr. Ernst and Dr. Milani to discuss the current campus conditions. Um, uh, Rob, can you talk about the numbers we're seeing and what we currently know about spread in our community, the severity of illness, and what we know about breakthrough infections? Sure, and, and good morning. Um, well, you know, last week we saw about 140 student cases on campus, and that's a lot. It's, uh, but when you consider that we had repopulation of the uh, campus of tens of thousands, you know, it was expected. And in fact, you mentioned earlier in your opening comments that we're watching what's happening at peer institutions. And that's been a pattern for big public institutions like ours who opened and started classes a couple of weeks or a week ahead of us where they saw sort of early mixing and exposures resulting in, in cases and then a stabilization. And that, you know, what we've seen so far this week uh, has been, you know, um, no increase from, from last week. And in fact, some of the, the trend we've seen, at least in our symptomatic cases, has been a reduction in the, the test positivity rates that we're seeing. So that tells us that COVID itself is uh, accounting for some of the respiratory illness that we're seeing, but we're seeing some of the more usual uh, respiratory illnesses that we've been accustomed to with a full, vibrant, you know, in-person you know, student population. Um, what we have not seen is any dramatic change in the activity of COVID in the surrounding community. So I think these speak to the, uh, the protection that's offered by populations where there's a high degree of vaccination. And I think that's important. And we're not seeing severe illness in the, uh, the students that were, were sick. The health service last week of those 140 uh, saw about 75 of the patients, uh, of the student patients. And uh, most have mild illness. And what I mean by mild illness has been sore throat and runny nose are sort of the more common uh, symptoms. And I think in the post-vaccination compared to last year, we're seeing less cough uh, than maybe what we had seen a year ago. Uh, so that's been the trend of what we see. As part of case investigation, similar to what we've seen in the past is that uh, uh, social interaction and social gatherings appear to be the drivers for a uh, spread. And, uh, you know, we haven't, uh, just as was the case last year, we haven't seen uh, evidence of spread in the classrooms or the lab settings. Um, so we'll be watching things closely as things progress out. Um, and, uh, you know, we have seen the, the cases have been uh, in vaccinated individuals. We're seeing that because our population is so uh, high degree of vaccination, that's not surprising at all. So that's uh, what we are seeing, but we're not seeing the serious illness. So Preeti, where's the pandemic heading? Well, I'm gonna just underscore and agree with the prior comments. And just uh, one note, I think there's a little bit of confusion in the messaging to the extent that people who are fully vaccinated, some of them are really taking themselves out of circulation, sort of waiting for the storm to pass. But on the flip side, people who have not yet been vaccinated, not so much in our community, but around the country, you know, are saying, well, vaccination doesn't work. And, and neither of these things are, are accurate in that sense that vaccination works as, as you, you presented uh, some really great uh, contemporary data. And uh, that ultimately this is what's gonna move us forward. Uh, and I'm thinking a lot and my friend Rob Ernst has, has really helped me think about this as thinking about illness versus infection. And that although we don't prevent all infections, we are preventing illness. And one of the really important things is that if you are vaccinated, and you become infected or, or ill, 
that you are less likely to spread to other vaccinated people. And, and I will say that we are holding our breath you know, collectively because it is risky to think about getting back to these things. But you know, we're now two weeks into class, uh, three weeks or so of campus really being repopulated. And you know, if you walk around, it's largely looks pretty normal socially. So I am uh, cautiously reassured. Uh, that is not the case everywhere in our country, but the places that are highly vaccinated are, are doing uh, the best, including uh, our region more broadly. And, you know, I did, I, I did uh, want to reflect on the fact, you know, tomorrow we're going to mark a very solemn and important uh, anniversary for, for our nation. But it's also 18 months from the day when we suspended classes in March of 2020. And, you know, this has really been difficult to get back to. And I think that when you talk about where the pandemic is headed, it's headed like this, where you know, dial up, you're going to dial back. And you know, I, I do want to remind folks to not just worry about preventing COVID, but really thinking about well-being more broadly. Thinking for students, thinking about your academics. I know, you know, things are heating up in in terms of schoolwork, and that it's it is a step up for for folks. And I'm hearing from a lot of families who are worried about their students. And you know, I just want to say that you know, the bigness here does make it hard sometimes to find your people, but you know, stick with it. And you know, just a parting message while we're preventing COVID, let's also think about being deliberate about having good social connections. That doesn't mean you know, go to a giant party, uh, but go for a walk with a friend, have lunch with somebody. You know, we don't have a vaccine for loneliness. So to me, taking care of maize and blue is not just preventing COVID, but it's really making sure that everyone feels like they belong here. Thanks, Preeti. Those are really important points. And you know, for me, a big difference this year is out on the campus, I actually can see joy, and I didn't see joy last year. It's, it's really very, very nice. Uh, uh, Dr. Ernst, you know, we've heard a lot of concerns about the classroom notification process, uh, creating some anxiety, some confusion, and lots of complaints. Um, can you share what the CHRC is doing and thinking about the notification process as the pandemic evolves and we're very, very highly vaccinated and masked? Sure, and I acknowledge that there's been some frustration because of just the number of them are going out without specific information. You know, we have received some feedback and the content of the notification changed a little bit this year to try and sort of uh, better communicate what's, what, the notifi what the notifications are intended to do. These are not the uh, uh, process by which we're identifying close contacts. We're responding to what had been just a an ask and uh, for transparency and 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 what what these notices do they come out based upon just a a, a class roster of when we have a identified case with their classes and classmates and instructors uh, they often come out before we've even done a case investigation completed that case investigation so it's not even clear that the student was in the class during those times and. We don't identify exactly which class at which time and which student. And that's standard for even with the, the case investigation for folks who are identified as close contacts. Uh, so if, after the case investigations is concluded, there will be direct communication for folks who have been identified as close contacts. So it shouldn't be confused that the notifications are part of that process. And if we find out that this is causing more confusion than they're helpful, you know, we may reconsider even doing those uh, at all. Um, I, I, I think that as you again alluded to in your opening comments, President Schlissel, you know, there's emerging evidence that in higher education, the um, situations where everyone is masked is a lower risk situation. You know, we, we heard about vaccination, you know, uh, resulting in an approximately five-fold reduction in the likelihood of getting infected. The evidence coming out about situations where both parties are masked is on par with that, an additional five-fold reduction. So that makes settings where everyone are wearing masks, you know, a um, some reassurance. So we also this week received some new guidance from the state about structuring uh, classrooms, and we're working with our academic affairs partners to think about feasibility for yeah, looking at that. That's brand new information, and we'll be looking at that as well. So more changes may come. So Rob, let me push a little harder on the notification question because we really are working to think about how to do this best. Uh, let's say I'm a student in a class, a student taking five classes and some of them are big, some of them are small, some of them are every day, some of them are once a week, et cetera, et cetera. And I get a letter saying someone in one of my classes 
uh, was diagnosed uh, with uh, COVID-19. What am I supposed to do or think? You know, how does that help me? Well, again, it, it's, it's information. It's a reminder that uh, if folks feel like they've had some uh, concern that testing is available to folks, even if they're vaccinated. Vaccinated individuals, even if they've been identified as a close contact, won't be expected to quarantine if they're asymptomatic, but it's information. And again, if we find that the information is causing more anxiety than relieving, you know, we, we can reconsider doing this. And what about from the perspective of a professor, Rob, of you know, someone who's teaching and they're teaching several classes and, we, and they receive a notice, you know, one of your students in one of your classes tested positive, uh, what do we expect them to do? Well, uh, the, I, I again want to emphasize that the notifications that are coming out should not be confused as being part of the case investigation or the identification of close contacts. So if somebody is identified as a close contact, they will be, identif they will be contacted individually with instructions on, about what to do. The class notifications are general information for awareness. Yep. You know, what I've been doing personally now that I'm out and about on campus is I'm presuming every setting I'm in, there may be somebody that has COVID-19. And I'm you know, taking that into account. If I'm in a big group of people, I'm, I'm indoors or outdoors, I'm cautious about wearing my mask. I'm wearing my mask indoors all the time. And I really wouldn't do anything different if I knew that somebody in that environment had COVID-19. I'm doing all the things I know how to do. Uh, so you know, I don't know if that's reassuring or not, but that's really the situation we're gonna be living with for a while. And, you know, the good news is the survey testing that you're doing shows that less than 1% of our random saliva testing for COVID-19 are, are positives. That's a pretty low uh, rate for, you know, a pandemic illness. So that's good news. So randomly, there's a, a small fraction of people out there, but it's small. And, and, and I actually would add to that, that, you know, the unvaccinated folks or folks who are not fully vaccinated yet are at greater risk. And the requirements are in place for those folks to be tested weekly. So they may be overrepresented in those data, the more vulnerable folks. Yeah, that's really interesting too. Uh, let me turn to some questions for the two of you that we've heard from the community. Uh, uh, Dr. Ernst, you know, what do you know about the severity and the symptoms on campus? And how do they compare to last year? Are things changing with Delta and changing with high levels of vaccination? Well, um, in terms of... In in terms of severity, I mean, we saw several thousand cases involving students last year. And in general, the presentations weren't severe in that younger, healthier population in general. So in comparison to that, you know, the, the student population this year, which is now much more highly vaccinated, I think is gonna, we'll see continued lower rates of transmission and the severity from what we're seeing so far still appears to be mild. You know, we again have been seeing cases at the health service. We've seen about 100 in the last two weeks so far combined here at the health service. The usual presentation is mildly symptomatic. And even, uh, and, and I mentioned what that looks like is runny nose and sore throat, headache, uh, plus minus cough. Um, we also, for asymptomatic cases that are diagnosed through surveillance, the health service, if it's a, if it's a student case, follow up with all of those cases. And we find that it's not unusual for even if the diagnosis is made while they're asymptomatic, many are going on to develop mild symptoms as well. So we've come to expect that, uh, and whether this is a Delta variant issue or not, I don't know, but we're seeing you know, that pattern of mild symptoms that resolve. Yep, thank you. Uh, Dr. Milani, if a student isn't sure about whether they should get vaccinated, and you know, now we're talking only about five or six percent of all of our 50,000 or so students in Ann Arbor, uh, what can they do? What should they do? Well, I would recommend making an appointment with the University Health Service with public health advisor, and these are clinicians at UHS who really can offer accurate information and really talk through any concerns a student might have. You know, it's, it's not too late to get vaccinated. I think that's an important point too. It's not that, well, it's, it's too late. You know, I'm going to, if I haven't had COVID, I'm going to get it. But I, I recognize it's not an easy decision for everyone, but please go and get good information. And the feedback has been very good on these appointments. Yeah, and I would say also, even some students that have had COVID that may be saying, well, maybe I don't need to be vaccinated. There is good data out there that if you've had COVID, the vaccine makes you even more immune and potentially even more resistant to variants. So there, there's still a good reason, even if you've recovered from COVID in the past. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Uh, Dr. Ernst, we heard some concerns about availability of testing last weekend. Uh, can you discuss testing and particularly weekends? Yeah, and I think some of this was uh, exacerbated by the fact that we started classes before the Labor Day holiday and we had a longer uh, weekend with the holiday stuck in there. But uh, I just want to uh, remind students particularly that there's multiple places where you can get tested now. And that's a big change from last year when now we've got these mature systems in place for, for doing testing. Um, the, uh, the CSTP has, um, that's the sampling program, the saliva-based testing program is six days a week. And we're looking at the hours for the demand for when folks will find that most uh, uh, helpful with their schedules. Um, and, and vaccinated students, if they're asymptomatic and they're concerned they've had an exposure, they can go to the CSTP. So the, the saliva-based uh, uh, testing program is not for students with symptoms. If someone is having symptoms, they should access the health service. And the health service has a, a variety of different ways they can get access. If they're not already registered for our patient portal, they should do that because that's the fastest way because they can self-schedule for a test through UHS on the patient portal, or they can call for an appointment uh, to get seen there as well. Uh, but there are multiple ways where they can get tested. And I think we were challenged by the long weekend and we're looking at where the demand is and we can try and match up. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Milani, when will the booster shots be available and who should get them? You know, that's, that's a question I'm getting a, a lot of. So right now, as you noted, uh, third doses are being given for individuals who are immunocompromised and that, those are ongoing. And again, that's a, that's a pretty narrow list. And I, I think most folks who uh, fall under that list have, uh, have already sought that third dose. Uh, I expect to hear more next week after the FDA advisory committee meets. Uh, likely there will be boosters or third doses, depending on what you, what you wanna call them. And it'll likely be highest risk folks first. And that means healthcare workers in our community, but also those in long-term care and then eventually older adults. And the recommendation may end up being eight months, but at this moment, there's not a recommendation broadly for that booster dose yet. But I think even within the next few days, we will hear more. Good, thank you very much. And Dr. Ernst, can you provide some insights on the numbers we're seeing in our quarantine and isolation housing uh, this year? And just how quarantine is going overall. It was a challenge early last year, got a bunch better, but what's it like now? Uh, uh, sure, and in fact, I appreciate the opportunity to um, recognize the staff in uh, university housing and in student life, as well as our partners in public safety who have been working as this uh, Q&I coordination team. That, that is something we had to build on the fly last year, and, uh, but is all much more mature now and functioning very efficiently. And we're getting good feedback about the students who are going through the QI process there. This year, we have just under 300 spaces available for QI. Some of those were occupied early on uh, as students were quarantining before moving into the residence halls if they were not fully vaccinated. That has sort of worked its way out of the system now. And we have sort of leveled off over the last week between 80 and 90 students in isolation because of uh, having been diagnosed with uh, COVID. Um, so we're watching those numbers real closely, but uh, we're running about 30, 35% capacity this past week. Good, very good, thank you. And so thanks to the two of you. I'm, I'm gonna turn things over to Dr. Milani now to speak with some of our other guests and ask some questions and I'll be back in a bit. Great, thank you. I think we're gonna begin with, uh, with our favorite epidemiologist, uh, Dr. Emily Martin, who has been uh, quite, busy uh, these days. Thank you, Emily. Uh, Emily, there's there's one question and I don't, okay, here's the slide now. Uh, can you discuss the new campus met response metrics and where we are as a community? And this is, I will just say that every week, twice a week, I get to hear sort of your take and I, I listen always with a lot of uh, interest, so. Absolutely, yeah, I can tell you where we are. So first of all, I wanted to mention that the, um, the you know, many of you have noted that the dashboard is being worked on. Uh, that fix is expected to come through soon. And so that, the, you know, some of these numbers I'm gonna give you, there's gonna be a lot more available publicly soon as soon as that repair is made. So um, we definitely, uh, uh, as Rob noted, a big increase last week corresponding to this 
big influx of people onto campus and a kind of huge expansion in the size of our community. Um, so that that wasn't unexpected. We're continuing to monitor what we want to see now is if that stays steady or if that continues to go up. So far, the numbers are staying steady with last week. Um, obviously, data is going to continue to come in all week, but we've got under 100 student cases that have come in so far this week, over 3,000 tests. Um, and so continuing to watch results come in, but pretty steady compared to last week um, so far with the data. The um, surveillance system, so the saliva testing, so I'm, I'm checking my numbers over here on the side, but the, the um, saliva testing, um, this is going to be people who, anybody who's not fully vaccinated or is in the process of being vaccinated, those people are all part of the testing program, including we are also testing a pretty large number of vaccinated people as well as part of this. That percent positivity is slightly down from last week, but pretty comparable. So pretty comparable levels from last week. Um, still remaining below where we were at our high point winter semester in that saliva, the surveillance testing program. Um, the, uh, you know, our contact tracing team is really busy. UHS has been really busy. A lot of following up with people has, have been happening. So we're monitoring those. Um, and lastly, I wanted to mention that, that, you know, we also use the CDC system to monitor what's going on around us in the county. The county is still at what CDC calls high levels. And, um, and so, you know, what that means is continuing to layer your protection, um, using masks, using masks when you're in groups, moving events outdoors when you can, continue to layer protection when we've got that high um, indicator. For, um, you know, and for all of these systems, we're going to continue to watch as the data from the holiday weekend comes in. Thanks, Emily. And I, ju I just wanted to make a, a general comment. You know, this is something that that uh, Dr. Ernst always reminds me of is that every fall, you know, long before the pandemic, we would have a surge in respiratory illnesses. And I, you know, I've heard from some students and some families like everyone in my residence hall is sick. And, you know, it, it doesn't mean they all have COVID. And I want to really emphasize that. And in fact, you know, Emily, your work yeah. has been in respiratory virus uh, epidemiology, you know, long before the coronavirus kept you busy. So uh, any any comments on that? Yeah, you know, it's not uncommon to see a lot of respiratory viruses this time of year. Um, there's a lot of pent up potential for these respiratory viruses because some of them have been in kind of hibernate virus hibernation for a little while while we've all been not interacting at the same level. I know right now um, nationwide we're and it's true for our region too, we're experiencing a big increase in some of our other common cold and flu viruses. Uh, respiratory syncytial virus is, is the one that's biggest notable, uh, the most notable signal right now is we're seeing a big surge of that around. So not every cough and sneeze is is COVID, but it's still, um, you know, kind of good to keep these other measures in place. Yeah, absolutely. It gets at the whole important issue of if you are sick, please don't go to class, you know, don't go out in public, you know, put a mask on and uh, get care, get tested. Thank you so much, Emily. Absolutely. Thanks very much, Professor Martin. Uh, I'll now bring in Provost Collins. Good morning, everybody. Yeah, good morning. So lots of questions for you, Provost Collins. Uh, I'm just going to get started here. As restrictions are being lifted, how is the university's research enterprise faring? Yeah, well, our research labs, uh, the research enterprise is open. Uh, labs and teams are masked, of course, working together. And so creating science and knowledge, which, which is actually really exciting. And there's a lot uh, that's underway there. So far in the fiscal year 22, we are $5 million ahead of the fiscal year 19, so pre-pandemic rate of spending. Uh, and that's a cumulative year-to-date increase of 3.4%, which is really good news. Our investigators have submitted new proposals with budgets about $32 million higher than we would have expected based on our uh, pre-pandemic averages. So of course, we do realize that the pandemic has and does have differential impacts on uh, some of our areas of study. And there are disruptions for some that are ongoing. But when we look at the whole enterprise, the researchers are fully engaged and actually operating above pre-pandemic. And that's true for scholarship and engagement in a lot of areas as well. Just to give one quick example, in the humanities and, uh, and arts, our 
faculty are making really important contributions to understanding how to be hu being human under COVID, which is actually the title of a forthcoming publication by our Humanities Institute and the U of M Press. So there's some really good news on the research enterprise front. Yeah, that, that is good news. And I just want to acknowledge uh, Rebecca Cunningham, Vice President Rebecca, Dr. Rebecca Cunningham and her team. You know, this was way back early, in the pandemic, just figuring out, especially getting people back to research that couldn't be done remotely. It was a huge lift and it really helped, uh, helped uh, inform the whole process of getting back classes. So that's really great news. Absolutely. Uh, last year, many of our international students were unable to travel and there was lots of uncertainty about conditions and visa access, uh, but you know now we're mostly in person. Can you give us an update on the situation for our, our international students? Sure, so I'm delighted to note that our international population on campus is quickly getting back to pre-pandemic uh, levels. We're not quite there yet. So as of today, we have 6,500 international students on campus and an additional 500 who are working to secure their visas and make their travel arrangements. And so we're likely to arrive in the coming weeks or perhaps days. We do have about four to 500 who remain in an unclear situation in terms of returning to Ann Arbor or arriving in Ann Arbor, and we're in, certainly engaged with them. So just to give a contrast, last fall we had over 2,500 international students who could not enter the U.S. and we only had 3,500 or so who were on campus and most of those were folks who were already here uh, and had not left when the, pand when the pandemic kind of hit. So we certainly wish all of our international students were here with us, but this is a significantly higher rate than we had anticipated and we really consider it pretty good news. It's just wonderful to have so many of our international students back on campus with us as things have reopened and uh, the, the energy and the excitement on campus as President Schlissel said at the beginning is really, um, really just a, a joy to see. Yeah, it's uh, wonderful news. And again, members of your team have been working on this for more than 18 months and, as, and including uh, the International Center. So just a big thanks to that group. How are we helping students, faculty and staff transition back to campus, including transition related anxieties? Yeah, so, I mean, I mentioned before the excitement and the energy, of course, there is also um, extensive anxiety given all the uncertainties, the, the unfolding news that we've been talking about. Um, the difficulties that we've had over the past 18 months continue to impact us in a variety of different ways, and they impact different people, of course, differently. Um, and so, you know, people are balancing uh, the different levels of concern and anxiety, the routines, the changes, and the ongoing COVID situation. So as far as students go, we have extensively expanded our programming for new and returning students. We're taking a much more holistic approach to wellness. Just to give a couple of examples, CAPS is offering a 90 minute virtual workshop that's called Return to U of M, Pause, Reflect, Redefine and Recover. Um, that workshop brings together CAPS therapists with a small group of, of students, a discussion focused workshop. That's gonna be offered every weekday through September 17th, so next Friday. CAPS also is expanding its peer support offerings and wellness coaching offerings have been expanded as well. And the student well-being site uh, has been revamped. And so that's a good place to go in terms of getting information about the wide range of resources available for students. And, and those will continue to expand. We're also offering a number of resources to help our faculty and staff with the transition. So for example, the Faculty and Staff Counseling and Consultation Office, FASCO, has prepared resources for both employees and supervisors so everything from tip sheets on reacclimation to, re, to on-site work to uh, meeting with faculty and staff groups in departments or units to discuss and focus on some of the reacclimation issues. Um, FASCO is available for individual counseling and consultations for our colleagues in Michigan Medicine. The Office of Counseling and Workplace Resilience is available to provide similar types of support and resources as well. And our Work Life Resource Center offers lots of information on child care, elder care, family helpers, the family to family program. We talked quite a bit about those uh, last year and those are of course still available. And there's information about other resources there as well. 
So we've really built that out uh, and uh, will continue to do so. I guess I think it's just a difficult time for a lot of families too that are transitioning back to K through 12 uh, learning for students. And I, I can't emphasize it enough. These resources uh, are there for you and uh, you know, please use them. And, and also the, the academic resources for our students as well, because you know, it's early in the semester, but before you know it, it's gonna be midterm time. So uh, don't, don't uh, wait to, to start using these. So thank you. Absolutely. Thanks very much, Provost Collins. Uh, next, we'll bring on Vice President for Student Life, Martino Harmon. And Martino, it was great to see you out on the Diag last night. You know, I think we were both at an event. Uh, La Casa, our Latinx student group, uh, you know, did their first in-person event since the pandemic. And a uh, big uh, audience of students outdoors, um, you know, interesting information, lots of joy, and it was great to see you there. That was great to be there. It was a lot of fun. And I, I'm glad the students uh, got to take some pictures with you. That was pretty cool. <laughs> I don't see the slide. Um, well, well, I'll start by saying good good morning, Dr. Milani, and happy Friday. <laughs> good morning, and and I actually have uh, I have the questions, so I could I can read them in the meantime. And uh, Martino, thanks for for all that Student Life is doing. Uh, I just wanted to touch base on this. Um, you know, this is it's what in particular is student life doing to help students have a safe and responsible uh, time during the, the night football game, which you know always uh, creates uh, different concerns. You know, the, the fall and the fall football season is an exciting time. And you know night football is exciting, but it also allows us to really reflect on, on how to stay safe, even when it's not a pandemic. So uh, I enjoy it. I'm looking forward to it. I'll be out there with my mask. On, but I want to encourage um, students who are planning get-togethers, uh, planning different uh, game game-like activities. That whether you're organizing uh, uh, something yourself or if it's part of a student organization, I really want to encourage students to download the Stay in the Blue app. Um, I, I actually downloaded it last night. It's really easy to find. Very very helpful information about alcohol use and other safety tips. And then also check out the Maze and Blueprint for guidelines uh, and resources that's, that talk about socializing safety. So that's really important. And I would also say, you know, it's important that we keep our friends and our classmates safe. And that's about not just about making decisions around alcohol and social interactions, but just basic decisions. If you don't feel well, don't go out. You know, you, you mentioned that earlier, and I'm Dr. Milani, <clears throat> don't risk spreading disease. Stay at home. Grab a blanket, some hot tea, watch the game. If you're into the game, don't spill the tea on yourself when you, we score a touchdown and, and just keep others uh, in mind. And wear, But if you are out, wear a face covering um, and follow all the uh, public health guidelines. And then finally, I would just say a word about expect respect. And that means we need to give respect to others and that's how we expect to receive respect. So behave with integrity, consideration, um, you know, watch your personal space and other space and, uh, and just have a good time. Yeah, those are, those are words that I use at home every day with my own, uh, my own children, uh, make good decisions. That's, a, that's kind of a, a, a big theme in our house. So I will, uh, will uh, underscore your comment in that regard. Uh, so not everyone goes to the game. Uh, what is Student Life doing to offer students ways to have fun even if they don't go to the big house? on football weekends, especially during COVID. And I, I've heard this, I heard this from last weekend where some students, because it was an extended weekend and there was a little bit less structure, they, they struggled a bit. You know, I'm a, I'm a huge football and sports fan, but you know, my oldest daughter could care less about football or any sports and who's playing. She's in the theater and movies and everything else. So I, we recognize that some students will look for alternatives. Um, and I wanna just mention a few of those. Uh, for example, if you um, want to come by the union before the game, there'll be lawn games happening out in front of the union before um, and, and during the game. And, you know, I may be out there myself because I have an event in the union earlier. And even afterwards, uh, late night, uh, late night bite, we call it, uh, will there be free nachos uh, in the union. So just save me one. Uh, hopefully I'll make it over there. But, but I would also say even tonight, um, there's a, an event that I know 
you were you were excited about you mentioned it last week is UMix late night um, on Central Campus, and that's an opportunity to just meet people, to make connections, new friends, come along, come with a group, and and really just hang out and have some fun. And that's tonight, actually, from nine until midnight, I believe. And then uh, I would just say, just to keep uh, aware of all the things that are happening, check out the Happening at Michigan website for all the details of events. And, and last but not least, um, I wanna thank the staff, many staff across campus that make all of these events possible. They're working late at night, early in the morning. They're doing a lot of planning that started back in the summer. So I just wanna mention that. Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm going to make an, a plug for these events. And, you know, I, I hear from some students saying, well, I don't want to go by myself. And, you know, grab someone from your hall, but also don't be afraid to go by yourself because other people are there. You know, they, they're there because maybe they don't want to be at the big house party or like, for that matter, at the football game. Um, and it is really important to try and, and make these connections and be delivered. And, and I would say this in a, in a nice way, like, you know, take a risk, like, Put yourself out there a little bit because I think that's sort of where some of the magic happens. And again, I you know nachos, wow, like that's uh, that's enough to to get to to inspire me to get there. But thank you so much, Mark, you know, and your staff. Well, yeah, <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Martino, and everybody else uh, who came to answer questions. Um, uh, one issue, uh, Dr. Milani, that we didn't hit when we were talking about the pandemic earlier that I think can be is brief and important is a uh, flu vaccine, influenza vaccine. So we're, you know, with all this attention on COVID, we're actually heading into flu season. Uh, this year in particular, it's really important um, to get flu vaccination, right? Because we don't want to confuse the issue. Everyone who gets the flu is going to think they have COVID. They might also have COVID. Uh, we don't know how the two interact really. Uh, can you give the community some advice about flu vaccination and uh, influenza during the era of COVID? Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for thanks for raising this issue. And and I know people are starting to get their flu shots. I tend to wait a little bit longer. But again, I think if it's available to you or you happen to be at UHS or something else, it's, it's not too early. And you know, Dr. Ernst can comment on availability. And we will be in the residence halls as well for students to, to get this done conveniently. And uh, you know, we talked about this a lot last year, and fortunately there wasn't a, an increase, uh, a big uh, surge in flu cases, partly because people weren't really mixing too much, but this year we fully expect uh, flu to be a, an issue. So again, it won't prevent all flu, but much like what we're seeing with the COVID vaccine, this should prevent serious illness and especially hospitalizations. Great, thanks. I thought that was very important. So we'll actually keep going with you, Dr. Milani, to moderate uh, questions and answers, of course, and we have a large number of questions that came in advance, and they actually overlap tremendously with the Q&A that's coming in in real time. Uh, so let me turn it back to you. Great. And I'm going to actually give the first question to you, President Schlissel. Uh, why doesn't the mask requirement extend to large outdoor events like football games? Sure. So, you know, we've worked with our medical experts, yourself and the CHRC included, uh, state and lo local governments, to really try to get the right balance to allow things like football and, you know, the Detroit Tigers are playing in Detroit and, you know, schools are playing sporting events all around the country. Uh, fans are back in the stands and, you know, it's part of you know, resuming cautiously uh, normal life and the things that bring us together and bring us joy. Uh, the balance we've struck takes account of the fact that uh, our community is very highly vaccinated. Our students and faculty and staff that I feel most responsible for are very highly vaccinated. We know outdoor events to be uh, much safer than indoor events, uh, but we are recommending people, if you're concerned uh, about risk, you know, wear a mask when you're in the big house. Um, we're requiring masking in the indoor structures uh, of the stadium, the restrooms, the indoor uh, pathways in front of concession stands. All of our uh, employees in the big house will be wearing masks to protect themselves. Uh, so, you know, this is an instance where we're asking individuals to make their risk assessment. It's outdoors, so it's not quite as dangerous. If you're vaccinated, it's not quite as dangerous. Uh, wear a mask if you're uncomfortable. There's no stigma to wearing a mask. Uh, if you choose not to outdoors, you know, the level of risk is, you know, acceptable, but it's there. And we'll continue to monitor things and we'll keep a track of things closely and see if uh, the situation changes. We'll be prepared to make changes as well. And we're also monitoring what's happening all around the country. 
Uh, so although we tend to think of the big house, multiply that times, you know, hundreds of football games going on on Saturdays across the country as well. Uh, but that's where we are. We'll make changes as needed. Great, thank you. Uh, next question I'm going to uh, give to Provost Collins. Is the university currently consider shifting classes to remote modalities? So thanks, Preeti. As people have seen some of the increases in the case numbers for students, of course, we know that this question has been a bit more frequent. So first, I want to reiterate what you and Rob shared earlier. Um, the case numbers are really a small fraction of our student body, and we're not seeing transmission in our classrooms. The data indicate that in-person classes are not increasing risk, given the level of vaccination that we have, given the masking indoors. And this aligns with what we've learned about COVID-19 over the many months and all of the kind of analysis and the work, of course, still ongoing. We also know that our students just benefit so much and cherish the in-person learning experiences that our instructors provide. Being together really enhances what the Michigan experience can do in terms of teaching and learning, in terms of research, in terms of all of the engagement activities. And we have a lot of systems in place that mitigate the infection and um, illness across the university community. I do wanna mention that in our classrooms, that includes ventilation standards that meet or exceed public health guidelines. And of course, the quarantine and isolation protocols that were talked about before and the indoor face covering requirements. So as we noted before, our classrooms are highly vaccinated. Over 93% of our students are vaccinated. And you've already heard about the metrics from uh, Emily Martin, Professor Martin, um, and how we're tracking those. And we'll continue to rely as well on guidance from, CHR, uh, from the CHRC. And again, you saw the, the membership there and, and we'll make sure that that information is available. Um, as President Schlissel mentioned in the beginning, academic affairs is included in the CHRC committee. And so we're constantly evaluating the information that we receive, um, all of the types of things that you've heard about, including our own data, the emerging research, the national, state, and local guidelines. And again, all this information is showing us that our classrooms in, are safe and we will continue to monitor. Yeah, and, and again, the K through 12 space has also been an interesting thing nationally. And you know, when you see outbreaks, they tend to be from social settings or from you know, eating indoors, it's not the classroom. So I, I, I wanna keep emphasizing that. And uh, you know, I hope that we're able to, to stay in uh, the face-to-face -face learning, as as uh, you noted, a lot of happy happy students. Uh, they are exhausted because it is hard work to actually leave your house and uh, go to class. But I think uh, they, they're pretty excited. So thank you for very much. So yes. So um, next question, and uh, uh, this is from uh, Vice President Harmon. You uh, know, Martino, we talked about this a little bit, but can you share your general impressions of how students are responding to the first two weeks? You know, uh, pre, pre, uh, President Slissel mentioned a word, joy. And that's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing so much excitement, so much energy, joy from students. And I'm really proud because I get the sense that students want to make things work. They want to they wanna have a successful fall semester. And you can feel it. The turnout has been tremendous at every event that, that I've seen. I've been out at many, many events. And, and students are really, really trying. Um, the Welcome to Michigan events were, were just really, really well attended. And I'll give an example of students really trying to be safe. There was an event Friday in the Michigan Union called Escapade, and there were hundreds of students in the Union. And I think there were only maybe two cases where we had to remind a student to pull up their mask. And students were just really trying to comply. And I've just seen so much of that, and I, I know it will continue. And I want to give a, a shout out to CSG and, and the leadership there for setting a good example and, and sending good messages to students about staying safe. So, so far, uh, very positive. And for me, you know, this is uh, my second year. So I'm experiencing all the, the new things that new students and second year students are experiencing. And it's been fun. Yeah, this is, it, it, I, joy is, is, um, is everywhere, including in, in my heart. <laughs> so, so thank you so much. And, you know, I, I think, again, we're just, we're just getting started. So uh, I'm gonna bring um, uh, Dr. Ernst back on here. And uh, Rob, 
you, you sort of touched on this with your earlier comments, but I'm gonna, I think it's worth revisiting. How is COVID classroom case investigation conducted? How can we be sure you're not placing students under quarantine who shouldn't be? Uh, right, we did talk about this a little bit and it's just a reminder that, uh, you know, uh, granting an exemption from the vaccine mandate doesn't exempt students from the other containment measures that are in place. And that's, you know, every time we have a, a case identified, there's an interview to try and identify others who have been in close contact. And if somebody's been identified as close contact, this is where we sort of sort of incorporate vaccine history. If somebody has been identified as a close contact, but they're fully vaccinated and asymptomatic, they're not subject to quarantine. It is suggested that in that case, they monitor themselves for symptoms and, you know, seek care and testing uh, right away if they have symptoms and maybe get tested anyway within three to five days afterwards is a good idea. It's recommended. If somebody's unvaccinated or not fully vaccinated and they're identified as a close contact through the case investigation process, they're going to be expected at, at this point to be uh, in quarantine. Now, we understand that can be disruptive and there is new guidance from the state that's come out about how to handle classrooms. And we're going to have to think through some of those other uh, uh, strategies, but uh, exemption from the vaccine mandate is not exemption from the uh, containment uh, other measures. You know, and again, I think this gets back at the issue of some people who have not yet been vaccinated. And I will say there's a there's a bunch that are in process. And I know UHS is doing another mass vaccination event tomorrow because uh, we had a number of people who couldn't access vaccine where they were, primarily those joining us internationally from international locations. So that number is going to continue to go up, but the remaining folks and you know people have different uh, reasons, primarily religious exemptions. But you know I just want to make sure people really think through some of this and get good advice because that disruption in your education is not trivial, and uh, I, I worry a bit about that. And we had this happen last year where there were a few students who were kind of on this perpetual quarantine, unfortunately, you know, and it was a very different situation. And we had actually twice the QI housing units. I mean, some people are focusing on the percentage full, but I want to remind everyone the denominators half of, of what it was last year. So uh, this is a question that has come up a lot, and I think it's on the parent Facebook uh, boards and stuff that somehow there's a feeling that there's a lot of fake vaccination records. Can you just talk about what's being done? Because it's not just that people like check a box, there's actually a verification process. So uh, sure. Um, so my impression is that uh, first I would frame it into something that Vice President Harmon just said a moment ago, which is by and large, the students are doing what we ask of them because they want to make things work. You know, so that I, that's the, uh, I think the prevailing undercurrent for, you know, when we ask students to wear masks inside, we're seeing them wear masks inside. And I believe the vast majority of students who are sharing their information are doing so accurately. Uh, I called out the uh, QI coordination team earlier for what they're doing with QI. There's another team of folks in our, our call center and contact COVID contact center who have been really working like crazy as the, the team that individually reviews the submissions for a uh, vaccine. And they're reviewing it for, uh, being fully completed. And there is an initial uh, check to make sure that the identifying information on those cards match up with somebody who's affiliated with the university. So that initial check for completeness and, uh, you know, a match with somebody in our community has been going on from the start. And they've been done over 100,000 reviews of these. And just like yeah, as people get used to seeing review of other kinds of uh, whether it's a, an essay for plagiarism or for some other kinds of cheating, you know, they, they, they've seen patterns that they're on the lookout for. We're also intending to do an, an audit of some of the, uh, particularly maybe those that have come in since the announcement of the mandate to actually cross-reference against the uh, registries. And if there are irregularities there, we're going to want to get more information about why those don't align. And uh, it's within the student statement of rights and responsibilities to comply with our, our COVID uh, mitigation strategies. And if we find that there's uh, uh, instances where students haven't been fully honest in that process, that could be a conduct issue. And I would expect it might. And another uh, question for you here. Uh, what are you doing about 
students who do not get tested through U of M and have positive cases, and again, you touched on this, do the students know that they need to report their status to U of M? What's stopping them from continuing to participate in class and other social activities? Well, we do hear about the cases if they're done through a lab. Uh, you know, these the reporting from uh, testing centers, whether it's an urgent care, emergency department, or clinician's office, or an independent lab, are all reported through the, the state registry. And then our relationship with uh, the Washtenaw County Health Department remains really important and very strong, positive. And uh, they have a, a designation for University of Michigan affiliates that then are referred to our team or our colleagues in environment, health and safety, very hardworking team that are doing the case investigation. Uh, it, it is a, and then, you know, the, the follow-up of those is, is quite regular. You know, once somebody is, you know, subject to isolation, the, that can be individualized on how that works, but then we stay in touch with those folks. Uh, there, there are now, you know, antigen tests that are more widely available, and we would uh, very much in, uh, want to know if people are testing positive on an antigen test. You can imagine that they wouldn't necessarily have to, but that would be expected. That if somebody is, you know, getting a, an antigen test from Walmart or, or Am, Amazon, and then you know, testing themselves, you know, we we need to hear about those as well. Yeah, and, and actually, we are hearing about them. And part of it is because if you get sick, you might need care, you know, and so I think keeping in mind, you know, just that this is not a, it's not meant to be punitive, like we, we just need to keep everyone safe and, um, and, and just a message that that information eventually comes back to us, it might just take a couple of days. And, you know, Rob, a related question, and I think either of us can take this, if students have, a, um, have been sick, but are test, have tested negative for COVID, what should they do? Yeah, this gets back to the fact that, you know, our activity we're seeing with a, a more you know, populated campus is looking more like college health again, you know, and I think some of the uh, structures we put in place to evaluate for COVID have actually given us more tools to, to look for some of these other common pathogens. Uh, the, some of the questions in the uh, Q&A I see address some of this. Yes, yeah, so our analyzers that we are, are using to look for COVID can test for other things like influenza, which we have not seen yet. And it's sort of a, an, a, a continued reminder that mitigation strategies against respiratory illness help with other things. But we have seen RSV cases. Our percentage positive for RSV, which is respiratory syncytial virus, is lower than the hospital's current rate, but that may be because of a higher pediatric population there. I'm not positive about that. But we also have seen um, cases of strep. We, we're tracking that as well. And uh, I think that is a, uh, an important reason, as you just suggested before, that if students are having symptoms, they should contact the health service. We can take those uh, appointments by phone or, you know, uh, access through the patient portal for self-scheduling. You know, we have ways to evaluate for the range of other pathogens and give good advice about how to stay well. That's college health. And it's a uh, feeling more like that now. It's nice to feel more like that. And I'm gonna give the last question to President Schlissel and then hand it back over to him since we're at the top of the hour. What can be done when coworkers continue to disregard the mask requirements? I've reported to my supervisor already. Yeah, you know, I report to your supervisor, uh, report to your unit's HR representative. Uh, our policies call for escalating consequences. It's, they start with written warnings, then disciplinary layoffs, uh, all the way up to a, a review conference and possible termination. Uh, so we take it seriously. It's a commitment we make to one another as members of the community uh, to follow these guidelines and to be masked while our public health advisors say that indoor masking is the smart thing to do. Uh, so there are consequences, local supervisor, and then uh, your local HR person as well. Uh, but look, thank you, you know, very much, Preeti, and all those that participated today. Um, I just want to make a couple of comments as we wrap up. Uh, the first is a lot of attention at these sessions get paid to students. And of course, that's why we're here. We're an educational institution, and we want to focus on helping our students stay healthy and help them get a great education and have a fantastic Michigan experience. But I want to give a really special thank you to our faculty and staff. You know, many of our staff have been working remotely, and they're now coming back to work. Uh, at least in a hybrid form, if not more. I've been working in the office most days now, and my office staff is back here as well. And 
you know, we're masked when we're near one another. I'm not masked when I'm in my office with the door closed, of course, like I am right now. Uh, but the faculty are back and they're teaching in person. And that's, you know, stressful. There's a, a element of uh, change and adapting to change. Uh, and I just want to say a big thank you. I know that it's hard. I know everybody is working harder than even their usual intense level of work. Uh, it's recognized, it's appreciated, uh, and things will get better as we're hearing now. Um, so a big thank you to our uh, faculty and staff for sure. Uh, recognition of the, the stressfulness of this and stress still remaining at home. And it's just a hard time. Uh, and I just want to say a big thank you on behalf of the institution. Uh, the second thing to our students is, you know, keep it up. You're actually doing a great job. We're approaching 95% vaccinated. I think we're going to level off somewhere around 96, 97%. Uh, which is, you know, there isn't another population in the state of Michigan that's as vaccinated as Michigan students. Uh, our tenure and tenure track faculty are 95, 96% vaccinated. Um, you know, I encourage our staff where the vaccination levels lag behind to get vaccinated. Uh, our represented employees, we're working with your, your union representatives and trying to hammer out good agreements to make sure that everybody takes advantage of this, a really important tool. Uh, if you're sick, stay home, please. You know, people try to tough it out. People feel pressure to come to work or students feel pressure to go to class. It's self-defeating. Please stay home if you're sick. And if you have symptoms, get yourself tested as a student or through um, occupational health if you're an employee. Uh, it's really important. Stay home, get tested. You know, you can't sort of be in a state of denial uh, and remain healthy. You know, you have to really help our entire community stay healthy. Uh, th so thanks again to today's participants, to everyone who's viewed uh, the, the uh, session today. We'll have an indexed version of a video up on my website in a little while. Uh, have a, a great weekend. Uh, enjoy Michigan football, either on TV or in person. Uh, if you feel uncomfortable inside the big house in the bowl, wear your mask. That'll give you several fold more protection even than just being outdoors and vaccinated. Uh, stay safe. Uh, thank you all and go blue.